We've heard this passage as we begin many times at funerals because it's often used as a funeral text. And so if you look at the first verse, uh, now, we, we could go back to chapter 13, but you can read that on your own word. He washed the disciples' feet. We talked about that last week, so I'm not going to cover that. And we talked about how he, you know, Peter said, not me, and, and uh, Jesus told him, if you don't do this, you have no part of me. And then he gives a new commandment. Uh, and so chapter 14, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. And I'll call out the verses while I'm going on. Verse 2, in my father's house are many rooms. One translation says mansions. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I think also you need to remember that in the Greek, the prepositions were not there. I, I think it should say when, not if, because he, he definitely is doing it. They add the prepositions as they see fit. So, and when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way where I'm going. And Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, this is where it gets interesting. He said, if you had known me, telling Thomas that he doesn't understand who Jesus is, you would have known my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the father, and it's enough for us. And Jesus said, have I been with you so long and still you don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the father. <coughs> now, from this and words like this, we get the concept of the Trinity. And the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but we believe Jesus is one with the Father, as he said here. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We know that the Spirit of God brooded across the face of the waters in Genesis 1. So the Holy Spirit was there in creation. We also learn from John 1 that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, referring to Christ, the eternal Logos, being present at creation. So we know Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have been present from creation forward. And so it's not just a, a thought. There are scriptures that back up the idea that the Trinity is real. The problem we have in conceiving of it is that they are all one, yet three separate personalities. So Martin Luther kind of made an acrostic out of a triangle saying that God is the Father, and the Father is the Son, and then on the other side it would say, but the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Spirit. <laughs> and, you know, in other words, God is all of these things, but then he's not he's because he's separate in personality. We can understand that a little bit if we look at our own individual selves. We have a body, we have a soul, we have a spirit. We're considered, in a biblical sense, tripartite beings body, soul, and spirit. Remember that verse, I, I pray that your body and uh, prosper as much as your soul, that your body and spirit prosper as much as your soul prospers. I wish that you would be in health and prosper even as your soul prospers. So it says here then that God is Jesus, if you will. Anybody arguing with that? That sounds pretty, pretty reasonable there. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? Jesus is the reflection of the Father's love. Everything Jesus did reveals God's love, forgiveness, compassion, and mercy towards sinners. And I want y'all to spend more time as Lutherans in the New Testament than you do in the Old. But I can tell you, the Old Testament will confuse you. And it will cause you to get depressed because it's not there's not much hope in the Old Testament. It's law. It's all law. If you do wrong, you're worthy of death in the Old Testament. That's why, you know, uh, you can watch these videos of, of uh, for instance, Muslims beheading a, a, a daughter as a, as a basically a mercy killing 
and they feel that because she broke the ethics of the family that she could be publicly executed. Well, that's Old Testament theology. You would execute people who broke the law. And if you stole something, chop off the hand. That's, that's where that idea, if your hand offends you, if your eye offends you, cut it out, pluck it out. Old Testament law. But we're under the grace of God. And, and because Jesus forgave sinners and said, I do not condemn you, we're no longer under condemnation. Well, I love that verse it says in, in uh, Romans, there is now, death, now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law, which is the Old Testament of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, has set me free from the law of sin and death, which is what the Old Testament brings. Now, the reason why I say this to you is I, I've had to counsel people who've spent all their time studying the Old Testament and just got depressed. It's very depressing. And they got confused because there's battles and wars and they didn't just kill one or two, they killed everybody, you know, and it's, it's just a, you have to understand that that was that side of the cross and we live on this side of the cross. I love the Old Testament, I read it, not only for its literary value, but there's, I mean, some of the best readings you can find is in the book of Proverbs. Just take one chapter a day every month, except for February, of course, you got 28 days, but most months, if you have 31 days, you can read a chapter in Proverbs and have the whole book read every month and go through it because there's wisdom in that book. Solomon wrote it. Now, I don't know how smart he was to have a thousand wires, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they had 300 wives and 700 porcupines, I'm concubines. That's a lot of women, isn't it? But so he must have been, I, I got it, I know this will make you ladies happy. The reason why he was so wise is he had all those women telling him what to do. <laughs> so Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, it's enough. He said, have I been with you so long and you don't know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? I'm in verse <coughs> 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak, I don't speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. The Father dwells in the Son just as the Holy Spirit dwells in you. Every Christian is born of the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit initiates your birth into the kingdom of God. Some, some theologian has referred to the Holy Spirit simply as God's midwife in the process of your birth into the kingdom of God as a child of God. It says we are born of the Spirit. And the Bible says that his spirit bears witness with our spirit, Romans 8, that we're children of God. So we, we don't even realize we're, we're born again Christians were it not for the Holy Spirit inside us agreeing with our spirit and confirming his presence in our lives. I call that the warm fuzzies you sometimes feel. That's the Holy Spirit acknowledging that you are connecting with God. And you have a connecting process. It's called prayer. Jesus said to his disciples when they couldn't cast out the demon, this kind comes out only by fasting and prayer. So when we pray, we get closer to God and we connect with his Holy Spirit who prays with us and through us when we don't know how to pray. So there is a presence with you. Now, you know, you probably saw Star Wars years ago and how they talked about the force, you know, and it's it's sort of like the force, but much bigger than that. Matter of fact, I was uh, on the board of ordained ministry in Oklahoma, and this young seminary graduate from Perkins, she, she was giving us her theology, and Lester, who was a district superintendent, was sitting there, and she said, well, let me explain the Holy Spirit to you. The Holy Spirit is the force in Star Wars. I said, oh, no, no. And Lester, being a DS, that's wonderful. <laughs> and I, I had to kind of set the record straight, you know. Uh, yeah, it, it sounds good, but he's not. He's much more than the force. He's God. 
just as fully God is as Jesus is. So it's not may the force be with you, may God be with you by, by his Holy Spirit. So do you believe that I'm in the Father and the Father in me? The words I say I don't speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. The works of Christ were to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons, and set people free. That's still the works of Jesus. And it comes through the church. So whoever knows the Father allows the Father through his spirit to dwell in him or her. Just, we are basically called to be like Christ. And the, the Holy Spirit works the same way with us as he did with Christ because we're physical human beings, as was Jesus. Believe me that I'm in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. So you can look at his life and say, well, anybody could stop storms and walk on water. It had to be pretty special in my book, wouldn't you say? And heal all the people that he healed. So we should believe on Christ simply because of his miracles. That ought to be enough. I don't know how anybody could be an atheist after reading the Bible or learning about Jesus and what he did and what he does. Truly I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works will lead than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. Now I know that's hard to believe. Individually, it's impossible that anybody be as good as Christ or greater. But corporately, when he is multiplied through the members of the church, and every one of us has an infusion of the Holy Spirit, then corporately, as we do the works of Jesus, and we are the body of Christ, he's the head, as we learn in 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians 4, we learn that we're following the head who gives direction to the body, but we're all individual members of that body. Now, you might be a toe, <laughs> you might be an ear, you might be a, now some people are nosy, you might be a nose, but the truth is we're all part of the body and no part is indispensable. How many, how many of you can do away with an appendage today without some grief? Any, we don't want to lose a finger, anybody? Or, anybody lost a finger? It's kind of hard after you've done that. To, you know, you get phantom pains in that finger. And if it's a really important digit, you know, I know a fellow named Al Potts. He's a preacher friend of mine. I went to seminary with him. And he was one of those ski people at, at uh, Florida that on, on the bottom of the pyramid, right? And he had all these women standing on his shoulder at, at uh, Cedar something there in Florida. But somehow or other, they got a little slack in the rope and it got caught around his index finger. Popped his finger slap off. But Al used it to his advantage. Because we would be sitting at a stoplight and he would jam his nub up his nose and it looked like he was tickling his brain. <laughs> and people would just stare. He had the best time with that nub of a finger. But the truth is, we, we really, are all indispensable. That's why we need the church. We need every member to pull their weight and do their part because we are the body of Christ. Whoever believes in me, the works that I do, and greater than he, these will he do. That's the only way it can happen through the church. And that's what he's talking about. Because in the in the verses to come, he begins to explain why the Holy Spirit's coming and he's going away. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And, and believe me, every answered prayer should and does bring glory to Jesus. If you ask me anything in my name, I'll do it. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments, and I'll ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. That's the parakletos in Greek. Another comforter. And the Holy Spirit is what that means. He'll give you the Holy Spirit. To be with you, until the last apostle dies, then I'm going to take him back away to heaven, right? That's not what it says here. It says to be with you forever. Everybody say forever. forever. The Holy Spirit's with us forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. If you're wondering why the world has a hard time understanding Christians, they just don't know the Holy Spirit. They don't see him. They don't know him. They can't. Their eyes are covered by the Bible says... The God of this world, Satan, has blinded their eyes lest they see 
and turn and repent and believe the gospel. That's what the Bible says. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. He's telling his disciples that the Holy Spirit dwelt with them as long as he was on the earth. But when he goes to heaven, the Holy Spirit will be in them, not just with them. There's a difference. Not just with, but in. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So when the Spirit comes, Christ comes. I will come to you, he said. Yet a little while, the world will see me no more. He's talking about his death. But you will see me because I live, you will also live. You've heard that verse in funerals. Because he lives, we live. In that day, you'll know that I'm in my Father, and you're in me, and I'm in you. That's a pretty good combination. Remember the old uh, commercial, you're in good hands with, with was it all stayed in? And they had, like, it looked like a house and cars stuck in the hand. You're in good hands with God. And we, he is in us, and we are in him. So let's see, what verse am I in there? I looked at I'm in the Father, you're in me, and I'm in you. Whoever has, verse 21, has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. If you love God, you'll keep the commandments. If you love God. You know, a lot of people don't like the commandments. I, I heard somebody arguing today on television, on national television, I guess, why uh, you support freedom and life if you support reproductive rights. In other words, the ability of a woman to terminate a pregnancy. And I got to thinking, wait a minute. How is that life to take a life? Because I just heard on the news yesterday that all those embryos that are frozen are now considered people. Did y'all hear that? Did y'all hear that? Yes. Well, what's that say about abortion then? We've got to quit calling that child on the fetus. It's a person. Thou shalt not kill. But just that simple. We're breaking the law of God, and there's no way to legalize it and make it right and call it a woman's choice because the choice is made before pregnancy. Not all pregnancies are immaculate conceptions. Isn't that correct? And only 1% are because of rape, and that's the argument they make. Oh, all well, these women got raped. They all got to get rid of that child. Well, that's 1%, and yes, you should make it. I think an exception for that because that child was not conceived in love. It was an act of violence. So maybe you disagree with me on that, but, but what if that child became a Mozart? <laughs> right? Or the next president for that matter. <coughs> he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Now Judas, not Iscariot, so that was Judas that he said to him, Lord, how is it that you will Manifest yourself to us and not to the world. So he heard, he was listening because Jesus just got to saying that. He said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. Now you need to mark these verses in your mind and go back and read them again. God loves you. God loves you because you keep his word and you love him. He loves you back. He loved you first before you ever started loving him. And it's important to know that you're loved by God. So many people have a bad self-esteem. And they have a low view of themselves because they don't feel loved by God. They just don't feel loved at all. And God loved so much that he stretched out his arms and died. That's how much he loved. He said, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Now look at those words. Jesus makes his home in the hearts of those who love him and keep his word. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Now, Jesus gave another example. He said, the person who doesn't keep my word is like the man who built his house on the sand. And the winds came and great was the fall of that house. The rain, you know that. That's why they're having trouble in Florida now. I could have told them not to build on the sand. And on the, on the coast of California, all those houses drop into the ocean. Did you notice they're built on sand, not rock? And he said, if you build your house on the rock, you're keeping 
my word and listening to it and doing it. Be doers and not just hearers, as James, the brother of Jesus, said. And there's another book we need to study in the future, James. These things I spoke to you while I'm still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I've said to you. The Holy Spirit helps you to remember what you've read in the Bible. There'll be times when I'm preaching a sermon and a verse will just pop up. I'm going, where did that come from? Well, Jesus said it happened. That the Holy Spirit would help me remember what I've read. And sometimes uh, I do a good job at it. Sometimes I don't. If I'm open and listening. All things to your remembrance I'll bring. And I'll te he'll teach you all things. He is your teacher. Uh, did you know that I, I learned most, most of what I know theologically by reading the Bible, praying, and asking the Holy Spirit to reveal it to me? He has been my teacher since 1971. He's been my teacher. He's been my professor. Yes, God. Tell him what? Checking on your Checking on my Yeah, that's probably my so the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father sends in his name, teaches us all things. He's your teacher. He's your guide. He's your comforter. He's your strength. He's your advocate. He's your friend. And if you need help understanding the scripture, stop and pray and simply ask this simple prayer. Holy Spirit, help me understand what I just read. And pr I promise you, he'll do it. I'm not special. He's been showing me stuff since I first picked up a Bible. <coughs> Peace I leave with you. Jesus leaves peace, perfect peace. Remember what it says at his birth, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. The angels sang that, my peace I give you, not as the world gives. Aren't you glad that the peace Jesus gives is better than the world's peace? Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. That's why these verses are so important at funerals. We get so fearful about death, but we should not be afraid. Jesus spoke to his disciples the first two words out of his mouth more so than any other thing was fear not. Fear not. Fear has torment, but perfect love casts out all fear, according to John. You heard me say I'm going away and I will come to you. If you love me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. And now I've told you before it takes place so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you for the rule of this world is coming. These were his final words. He knew he was about to go to the cross. The ruler of this world is the devil. The God of this world is God, but the devil rules. And he will rule till, till his kingdom is overcome by Christ when he comes again. He has no claim on me. And guess what? Because the devil has no claim on Christ, the devil has no claim on you because the Spirit resides in you. Which means you can say to Satan, take your hands off of God's property. I belong to Christ. Get out of my house. Get out of my family. And the Bible says if you resist him, he will flee from you. But you have to resist him. And don't say, oh, well, I'm just going through this persecution because... God's bringing it. God does not bring persecution. Trials come because of Satan. He has no claim on you. But I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let's go from here. Then he continues. Now we've got the idea of the vine and the branches. I'm the true vine, chapter 15. And my Father is a vine dresser. Every branch that's in me does not bear fruit he takes away. Any of you farmers ever prune a fruit tree? Or a tomato plant. Anybody's got tomatoes, you prune them. You know what a sucker is? You need to do that then, because they grow right between the branches, snip them, and you'll have more tomatoes. Get rid of them. My daddy taught me that. He was one of the best tomato farmers you ever ran into. So it says here, he wants to prune it so that it may bear more fruit. Already you're clean, because that means God, when you read the Bible, he prunes the sin out of your life. Because every time I read the book, I see something I'm doing that, that could be divine to sin, and I go, ouch, and oh me, oh, help me, Lord. 
and it points out that I need to improve. If you want to improve yourself, just read Galatians 5 closely and try to emulate the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, meekness, self-control, or, or think on these things, whatever is good, pure, lovely, of good report. If there's any virtue, any praise, think on these things. Don't think bad thoughts, think good thoughts. Produce good fruit. Do what the Word says do. He prunes it so it may bear more fruit. Already you're clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. The word of Christ cleanses you. And he says, abide in me and I in you. I love that. Abide in Christ and let him abide in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in Jesus. He says, verse 4, I am the vine you're the branches. So we're not the source of the sustenance. The branches draw their sustenance from the connecting vine. We're all connected to the source of life, Christ himself. It's like plugging your, your uh, electronic device into the wall. That, that, that current goes through the wire to the device, but the wire's not the source of the power any more than you are. We're connected to the source who is Christ. That's why we can do the works of Jesus. We're connected to him. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That's something to remember. We, we are absolutely powerless outside of Jesus. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown to the fire, and burned. And y'all know what that's talking about. If you abide in me, and my, my words abide in you, ask what you wish, and it will be done unto you. John 15, 7. Now here's an easy way to remember that. There's a song that you can put it in your head real simply. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Real simple. Ask what you will, it will be done. For by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I've loved you. Jesus loves you as much as the Father loves him. Isn't that, isn't that nice to know? As the Father loves me, so I've loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. You see, the commandments are not optional. They're mandatory for every Christian and every person walking earth really you, you will abide in my love just as I've kept my father's commandments and abide in his love verse 11 these things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full do you sometimes lack joy spend more time with Jesus when you do in prayer joy will begin to take over and joy comes from within it's not something that happens to you. Rejoicing is something you do as an expression of the comfort and peace you find in Christ. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I've loved you. Greater love has no one than this. He laid out his life for his friends. You've seen, you've heard the stories of, the, you know, the grenade in the foxhole. And one soldier dies on it and saves the rest. That's what Jesus did for you. He dove on the grenade that should have killed you. Sent. He took it. And he lays down his life for his friends. You are my friends. <clears throat> if there's anything that you get out of this study tonight, I want you to walk away <clears throat> realizing that Jesus is calling you his friend. He's your friend. And you are his friend. He loves you that much. You are my friends. Everybody say that together. You are my friends if you do what I command. No longer do I call you servants. Now remember, he just got through washing their feet saying they've got to be servants. But he says, no longer do I call you servants for the servant doesn't know what his master is doing, but I call you friends. For all that I've heard from my father, I've made known to you. But you did not choose me. I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. 
he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. It's a command to love one another. There should be no such thing as a church fight. So think about it. <laughs> Churches that are fighting one another are just, they're not following what Jesus said to love one another. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. Don't think you're special just because <laughs> non-Christians don't like your smile. <laughs> if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. It's real simple, isn't it? Darkness and light, oil and water. You know, they don't mix. Remember the word, verse 20, that I said to you, a servant's not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll also persecute you. If they kept my word, they'll keep yours also. But all these things will, they will do to you on account of my name, because they don't know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Another reason to understand that no one has an excuse, and there is no such thing as an atheist, is when you read Romans 1 where it says the universe itself tells us there's a God. You can't look at the sky and say there is no God. You can't look at his handiwork and say that there is no God. It's his signature. Whoever hates me hates my father. Haven't y'all noticed that? That there's a backlash in America against Christians and they hate God. They don't even want his name on their money. Haven't y'all noticed that? It's everywhere. It's everywhere. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now that they've seen and hated both me and my father, now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. People that hate God have no reason to hate him, for God is love. Why, why would hate and love be even in the same sentence together? But when the Helper comes, he whom I send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. What does it mean to bear witness if you're in a court of law? It's a testimony. And you're bearing witness and on the account of two or three witnesses, it's established, right? It's a fact. Well, you have three witnesses, the Father, Son, and the Spirit. And the Spirit bears witness with the Father and the Son about the Son. And you also will bear witness because you've been with me from the beginning. I've said all these things to keep you from falling away. Now notice verse 1 of chapter 16 gives us the idea that it is possible to fall away Hence the doctrine, once saved, always saved, is ridiculous. Because Jesus himself said, I'm telling you these things to keep you from falling away, which means it's possible to fall away. Elsewise, Judas would still be saved. Right? Does that make sense? They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he's offering service to God. And believe it or not, every one of them were killed for the sake of the gospel. All of them. Verse 3, verse chapter 16. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father, nor me. But I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you, are, you will remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now that I'm going to God, to him who sent me, and none of you ask me where you're going, but because I've said these things, sorrow has filled your heart. So here they are moping and groping and begging him not to leave. They're crying. And he's trying to tell them, look, it's for your good that I'm going away. Nevertheless, he said in verse 7, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. To our advantage. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. Why? Because the Helper, the Holy Spirit, was in Jesus on the earth. And when he ascended to the Father, he poured out the Spirit on all believers. That's how we can do greater works. Do you understand it now? Each of us sitting in these pews today is filled with the Holy Spirit. And it magnifies the ministry of Jesus. 
Well, let me put it this way. You will be filled with a spirit of one kind or the other, good or bad, right? The helper. If I don't go away, the helper will not come to you. So the Holy Spirit could not come unless Jesus ascended to heaven. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he did on the day of Pentecost. And when he comes, the Spirit, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness. Every sermon that brings conviction is the Holy Spirit at work because he is the one that convicts of sin, not the pastor. Oh, the words that he read by, I mean, I remember I used to hear Billy Graham preach and I always felt, oh, wow. You know, he, he was strong, talked about hell and all that. And I realized that it was, there was conviction in his meetings that thousands of people would come forward. It was the Holy Spirit doing that. He convicts the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin because they don't believe in me. It's a sin not to believe in God. Concerning sin because they don't believe in me. Concerning righteousness because I go to the Father. And you will see me no longer concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Satan is already judged. His time is coming, but he was judged on the cross. And he was defeated on the cross. And I can show you that in Colossians 2. I still have many things to say to you, but can't say them now. You can't bear them now. We would have had a lot more teachings from Jesus, but we would not be able to consume them or understand them. But he is telling his disciples that when I go away, the, the comforter, when I was reading these, these chapters as a young 20, 21 year old man, I took it literally that the Holy Spirit was gonna be my teacher. And I started following that. And he has been all these 50 years plus. It says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. When the spirit of God speaks to you, it's God speaking through the spirit, not on his own authority. Even Jesus said the words I speak come from God. When the Holy Spirit shows you something, it's coming from God. And he will even show you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. Now all that the Father has is mine, therefore I said he'll take what's mine and declare it to you. And we're going to stop at chapter 17 in just a minute. A little while and you'll see me no longer, and again a little while and you'll see me again. Some of his disciples said, what's this? He says, a little while and you'll not see me, and a little while you will see me. Because I'm going to the Father. <clears throat> So they were saying, what does he mean by in a little while? What? We don't know what he's talking about. The disciples were just so, so abundantly ignorant. <laughs> they, they, were, they were thick as a rock. They, so a lot of times they didn't get it. To, it's kind of like not seeing the forest for the trees. They couldn't see that God was in the room. Jesus knew what they wanted to ask him before they even said a word. So he said to them, is this what you're asking yourself, what I meant by saying a little while and you'll not see me again, a little while you'll see me? It's almost funny, isn't it? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but when you're sorry, but your sorrow will turn into joy. Everybody going through in death needs to read that verse. Your sorrow will be turned into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she's delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the pain. Well, I, that might be that Jesus said that because he was a male. I think you you women out there probably do remember that, that agony of childbirth. I know that when my first son was born, I thought that my wife was going to rip my head off. She screamed, you did this to me. <laughs> I wanted to leave the room. <laughs> For joy that a human being has been born into the world. Isn't it a joy to see that baby pop out? So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and that, that your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. No one can steal your joy. And remember Nehemiah said the joy of the Lord is your strength. If you don't have joy, you're losing strength. No one can or will steal your joy. 
Keep your happiness. In that day you'll ask nothing of me. Truly I say to you, whatever you ask in my Father's name, he will give it to you. Until now you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. We should be a people of prayer, knowing that the more we ask, the more he will give. I have said these to these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. Now he's talking about when he's already gone, when the Holy Spirit comes. And look at what happened with the apostles and the letters we have in the epistles, where we learn so much about the Father. In that day you'll ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you. There it is again. Everybody say, God loves me. God loves me. It says it in verse 27. Again. Because you have loved me, and I have believed that I and you have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and am now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. And the disciples said, oh, now you're speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. They were starting to understand it, right? Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered. Let me ask you all a question. How many of the disciples ran that night when... Peter cut off the servant's ear. The guy that was writing this text had a cloak on. John, he took off naked running through the woods. Has anybody here ever run naked through the woods? I did as a Boy Scout, but it wasn't my fault. Our troop master had another troop attack us and strip our clothes off and throw our underwear in the trees. We had to make our way back to the campfire. Terrible. You talk about mosquitoes. I didn't know they could bite all over you. Jesus said, The hour is coming when you'll be scattered, each to his own home, and you will leave me alone. They're all, now they're saying, We know you came from God. We're on your side. We know that all things are possible through you. Yeah, but all of you are going to run, each and every one of you. Yet I'm not alone. He knew that they were going to run. But he's not alone because the Father was with Jesus. I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you'll have trouble or tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. We're going to next week get into that high priestly prayer of chapter 17 and then talk about the Garden of Gethsemane next week. Let's... Uh,